Hey everyone, thanks again for tuning into Sin's Workshop. Hope you're having a wonderful day. Okay, so today we're going to be talking about um, Into the Hourglass by Emily R. King. This is the second novel in the um, Evermore series, I believe it's called. Um, sorry, just had to adjust the tripod real quick. I have to say, um, I was a little hesitant picking up this book because it's been about three years since I read book one. I mean, this book has been sitting on my digital shelf for a few years. Um, and I think we as readers, we tend to always want to reread books because it's like, A, we really love the series and we want to refresh our memories, and B, we want to refresh our memories of the events that happened in the, you know, previous books. Unfortunately, me, I get a lot of arcs from publishers. I get a lot of books from publishers, digital and physical. Not to mention I have my own to be red pile. So I don't really have a lot of time to reread books as much as I would like to. Um, so I was a little hesitant. I was a little worried. I'm like, oh my god, am I going to remember what happened in book one? It's been so long, you know? It's more than just that one year gap. It's been three years now. <laughs> but I read the synopsis of this book that refreshed my memory a little bit. And then while I was reading this book, one of the things King does quite successfully in this narrative is she integrates important elements from the first book into this book. You know, she's reminding you as a reader what happened, but she's not ruining the momentum of this book. In fact, she uses what happened in the previous book to drive the character's emotional state, their dynamics, the plot, and I think that that's really good. I mean, you're probably thinking, well, yeah, of course that's what happens in this series. You know, a lot of people, they just kind of continue writing the story, which isn't a bad thing. It's just how it is. They don't really utilize reminiscing of the um, previous books to really add in some of that tension for the storytelling. And that's something I liked. It was one of my strongest takeaways from reading this book. Because you're in Everly's head, you know. She is so driven by uh, her need from... For revenge from Prince killing and you don't you definitely understand that I mean this is the guy who killed her entire family and killed her as a little girl or tried to kill her as a little girl why because she was in the wrong place at the wrong time I mean this is the man who took her family away from her and I thought personally that it was really compelling as far as characterization goes you're seeing how clo kind of closed off she is. You're seeing how single-minded she is. Just She's just driven. She's like, great, I have um, Father Time backing me on my journey for revenge. In fact, he's pretty much giving me all the tools I need. Because stopping Prince Killian works in favor of father time himself because you know, Prince Killian has pretty much stolen time. He's immortal. He should not be immortal. Everyone has an expiration date, but he has cheated the magical powers that be in this book far too many times. And he's continuing to try to do that. So father time has tasked Everly with this saying, we gotta stop this dude. You in? And she's like, hell yeah, I'm in. This man threatened my uncle. He killed my family. He tried to kill me. He's a abusive, manipulative bastard. Damn straight, I'm in. And he is, and I really do like that that is kind of what drives the story forward, ultimately. It really does keep the momentum and the pacing forward. It keeps it going up and up and up and up. I mean, I mean, it's just like bam, 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 bam. It's such a quick read because the pacing goes so quickly. It's hard to imagine that this is a 
I think it's like 350 page book. I mean, that's what I love about really good books. You know, it doesn't matter the length. A really good book will just kind of get you in there and you forget about the page length. And I do like noting page length in my reviews because sometimes it's important. Sometimes I read 100 page books that, oh my God, they drag and they feel like for, it's like, oh my God, this book should have taken me an hour to read and it took me three days. Whereas this book took me, I think, four, 14 hours, 14 hours. That's it. Um, it's basically, that's mainly due to me reading it as an audiobook, so I was just kind of listening to it. Um, mind you, I did have the ebook, but I just didn't have the time to read the ebook, and I really wanted to read this book, so I'm like, audiobook, here we come. And I do like the audiobook version. Um, I did read an ebook version of the first book. It's, they're on the same level for me. Um, the storytelling, the characterization, the dynamics. I really think the story itself just carries the reader forward. And that's what I like about it. You know, that's what I think is really good writing. When an author is able to really lure you in as a reader and get you sucked into these characters. I also think the story had a really lot, had a really lot, grammar Cynthia I really think this story had a good amount of character growth as well Everly she spent her life you know she grew up in a world where magic is kind of like e you know and her uncle pretty much encouraged her to keep people at bay. He's like, you don't want people finding out about your clock or part. And he's right. In the society that she lives in, if people were to find out by her clock or part, they would shun her, try to hang her, try to burn her at the stake, abomination. You know, those things do happen. Like, her worst fears come to life near the end of the book. But I think growing up like that really kept her from experiencing true friendships and she does discover those in this book you know and I think that that's really one of the strongest moments for this story when she realizes these people are my friends they care about me me my clock heart and everything these are people who truly do care about her and they only asked, you know, they're like, we understand why you didn't open it up to us, but we wish you trust us enough, you know. So they do have a few heart to hearts. They do grow that trust. They do grow into having really wonderful friendships. And for Everly herself, she's really learning that despite not having a physical flesh and blood heart, she can love. I mean, you see this juxtaposition. You have Killian. He's a manipulative bastard. He's flesh and blood. He's got a heart. He's claimed to have loved women. Right? They've been a love of his life. But he's an abusive bastard. He, he is just a manipulative bastard who just kind of keeps stringing you along until you have, until you have no more use to him. It, he, if there's anything he loves, it's himself. He loves himself more than anything else. And then you have Everly. Not one all flesh and blood, clockwork heart, and yet she loves with all of her being. She cares so deeply about people. Um, does she put herself first? Yes. But she learns that she really does have to take everybody else's opinions and feelings into perspective first. And she does. You know, she puts, she does start, you know, midway through the book really putting other people's feelings first. And I think that that's really a great show of her character arc and her character development. And you understand where she came from. I mean, she came from not really having any friends 
to being really scared. Like, I can't really let you in because if you see my clockwork heart, you're probably going to, you know, ostracize me and abandon me. To really growing to trust these people, this ragtag group, you know, Cat and Fox and her, her would-be husband who, you know, married her, just kind of, he was in love with her. He is in love with her. Um, but he did it to kind of save her. And I think that that's a really sweet moment. He's like, we, we, he's like, I'm in love with you. You may not love me, but if you marry me, I can save you from this, slut, you know, prison colony. And she's just like, okay, I have a task to do, so let's do this. But she really does grow to love him. And she didn't think she was capable of that. And I think that that's such a great moment for her. Like, husband. Uh, <laughs> that's her. She's like, husband, I do love you. Um, I really do like that character growth. And I do like the character dynamics and how they really do grow throughout the narrative. And I do like the pace and the momentum. Overall, I really did enjoy the story. Um, I do have to say that 100%. So, you know, if you want to purchase the book, please remember to purchase the book for your local bookseller or online re retailer. Mm, before I forget, I do have to give this book 3.75 out of 4 out of 5 stars. Uh, only that because this is the second time I'm recording this review, and the first time I recorded it, I couldn't remember Everly's name even though I just read the book. So I think that does say something about how memorable she is as this character. Don't get me wrong. I did like her as a character. I thought she was fierce, had strong, great character journey and character growth. But I think it does say something when I, it either says something about my poor memory <laughs> or um, the fact that I couldn't remember her name. Like, I can remember anything else, like the Dorka, which, which is like the whale from Pinocchio, who transport them to the land underneath the waves. I mean, that's a really cool scene to open up the book. Um, and then Prince Killian and Cat and Fox and the Pixie and Father Time. I um, can't remember Prince Killian's girlfriend's name, but... Eh. Um... The Selkies. <laughs> There's a lot of things I remember. I just couldn't remember her name, which I thought was really weird. Um, but I do think that speaks to how memorable she is, which is why I can't give it the full full, full stars. Can't do it. But it is definitely better than the three and a half um, star book. Not quite as good as a four star, so 3.75 is where I'm going to put it. Um, please remember to purchase a book from your local bookseller, online book retailer. I say that because, yes, the book may be cheaper on Amazon, but you have to remember when you're buying a book cheaper, you are limiting how much the author gets back as well because they only get 10%. You have to remember, the publisher has to take their chunk first. Um, it goes, and Amazon has to take their chunk first as well. So it goes... Amazon, publisher, and then the author just kind of gets what, what, what trickles down to them. <laughs> um, on that note, please remember to support me here by liking this video and subscribing to my channel. Please rem also remember to share with your book-loving friends. I hope you all have a great rest of your day, and as always, happy reading!